So if we flip back to the Bitcoin chart that Max had up and we go back to that high of 2021, right? So let's go all the way back here. You could see very, very clearly, all right? And it takes me just a second to go back. There we go. And we'll zoom out just a little bit. Here's that same run up, pull back. There's your double top pierce of the highs. And then we know what happened in this case. One of the more challenging aspects of investing is thinking about events and the expectations of price movements around them. What we saw last week in the crypto market after the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC, took action against Binance and Coinbase was a perfect example. Specifically, how do you explain the broad market sell-off following the new allegations against Binance, the world's largest exchange, but a rebound following the case filed against Coinbase, the biggest U.S. exchange, soon after? Part of this puzzle could be potentially solved or at least untangled by considering market expectations and related positioning. Hello and welcome to Money Talks. In today's video, we have Gareth Soloway and Raul Powell talking about the Fed stopping raising the interest rate and what the effect on the stock market and the crypto market. Gareth also shares his predictions for Bitcoin and more. So without wasting any time, let's get into the video. A couple things I want to show you here. If we go to the NASDAQ chart, the NASDAQ from the all-time highs back in 2021, we fell approximately 37%, right? So 37, 37.5%. If we look at the bounce off of the lows, we have gone up right now about 36%. If you look at past big cycle highs, aka the dot-com bubble, there's this kind of tendency for markets to collapse X amount and then bounce that same amount before rolling over back to the downside. So just to show you an example of this, if we go back to the dot-com level, right? Here's your dot-com high on the NASDAQ. It fell from the high of the dot-com uh, pivot point for the first leg down. Remember, this is just the first leg down in the, in the dot-com collapse. 40 to 41 percent it bounced 40.25 percent approximately right so so again you can see almost identical bounces so what that tells me if we go back to the nasdaq chart it tells me that you know there might be one more percent one and a half more percent higher on the nasdaq but we're kind of running into the end of the run according to past psychological kind of tendencies for investors to jump long now, if you look at the psychological nature of investors right now, extreme bullishness, the greed and fear index is in the major intent greed zone. So you're having this, which is what, what bigger bear markets do. They lure the bulls back in. And I would just be very, very cautious here, especially after the Federal Reserve came out and said, hey, listen, yeah, we're going to pause, but expect more rate hikes. Then you saw jobless claims today come in. Yeah, last week, 266, which was the highest jump, 266,000, highest jump since, you know, like two years ago, uh, or even more. And then this week, it confirmed with 262. So almost the same number again. And that tells me that a lot of people are starting to file for unemployment. Eventually, that's going to filter into the unemployment numbers at the end of the month, as well as um, the the employment numbers starting to go negative. So, so my guess is this is all kind of you look at the data, and then you look at the charts, and it's starting to kind of confirm. Looking into the regulated futures market positioning data helps us determine what actions investors have taken to align with their market views. Why the positioning data and why regulated markets? Well, it's good to understand how traders and investors were positioned going into the event, and there have been many allegations of wash trading in unregulated markets. A good mental model for investor positioning is to think about passengers on a boat. If everyone is spread out across the boat, a specific passenger moving from one side to another does not impact the net balance much. But if everyone is on one side of the boat and it's not capsizing and someone decides to break from the crowd and catch some fresh air on the other side, that contrarian move will have an outsized impact on the net balance of the system. Positioning alongside investor deleveraging dynamics can also help explain relief rallies. From digging into the positioning data, we can see that both Bitcoin and other futures net positioning for leveraged money managers are net short and are at or near one-year lows, which confirms the relatively bearish expectations for both tokens and, by proxy, the greater crypto market. With positioning at these bearish levels, the market is more resilient to bad event news and has an increased sensitivity for positive developments to flip short positions to positive. It is no economic tsunami coming. It's a relentless rising tide. And when you look back, you go... Oh my God, it's gone up further and further and further. Everyone waiting for the tsunami, if we didn't get it, 
in March 2020, we're never going to have it at all. So you have to realize that there's something different. So let me put it in the perspective for others to understand what this means. A millennial and a boomer, father and son. The father, when he was 30 years old, was probably, it was about 1980, 81. Then they had record low valuations for the stock market, a P of seven. Record high interest rates. So he saved money to stick it in bonds, made 18% or 15% record high credit on corporate debt and really cheap property. So the baby boomer had this huge set of opportunities ahead of him. And gold was pretty cheap too, but was going up quite rapidly. So when you look at the percentage of those assets that they could buy with their wages, we get a number. Cut forward to the sum. 32 years old, 2021. They can buy 60% less in property than their parents could for the same median wage. They can buy a lot less of the S&P, a lot less gold. So if, what are those things? Those are assets. The price of milk must be about the same, but it's the assets. Why assets count is assets are where you save. Those are the things you own that go up in the future and you release the money from and that's your return on investment. But a young person now can make a lot less investments than their parents could. That is what is going on slowly over time. Your share is becoming less. And that is what's driving the rich-poor divide. Because the rich all get access to this free money and can buy more of these assets that go up. The more they go up, the richer they get. The guy on the median income who's 32 years old, can't own any of that stuff. Both positioning and market expectations dig into a bigger concept of reflexivity within financial markets as pioneered by George Soros. In short, market reflexivity suggests that investor perceptions and behavior impact market conditions, which in turn impact and shape investor beliefs and actions. This circular, self-referential feedback loop leads to non-linear market dynamics as cognitive biases and expectations build on each other to impact market prices and investor positioning. This can explain the emergence of price trends that can become self-fulfilling over the short run and self-correcting over the longer term as traders chase prices until expectations and positioning for continued price moves can only result in a reversal and correction, much to the disappointment of traders who recently started following the trend. While it's never a good look for a regulator to target two of the largest exchanges in a single week, last week's regulatory headlines provided us with a real-world case study highlighting the importance of market expectations and positioning in providing the setup for event price moves. It all really started in around 2000 when that bubble popped. The Federal Reserve decided that the only way forward was to use interest rates to drive kind of demand. And it was a massive debt boom that followed. That debt boom, as we know, blew up in 2008. And for many of us in the macro world, that was something that we could see. It was pretty obvious it was going to happen. I was one of the people at the core of that predicting what's going on. And many of the famous people in the big short were kind of subscribers of my research service, the Global Macro Investor. We kind of all knew it was happening, but people in the street didn't. So people would come up to me and say, well, why don't we know? And I realized that that information hadn't really got out there. And I realized that I had access to information other people didn't have. And it wasn't fair. And after Occupy Wall Street, the rise of populism, you knew that, that the power had to be given to the people. The democratization of information was vital. After 2008, I realized that the problems hadn't gone away. The same problems were there. And all the central bank had done was generate more debt by generating lower interest rates. And now they'd started quantitative easing, which is basically the printing of money to try and hide those debts. And it became clear to many of us that the next recession was gonna be a big problem. If 2008 was bad, the debt burden was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So something bad was gonna break. So is it a good time to invest in Bitcoin? And what's your prediction for Bitcoin in 2023? Tell us in the comments. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you soon with the next video. Thank you so much for watching.